Welcome to Coffee to Go, where we center ourselves in the seasons, scriptures, and holy days of the Christian tradition. I'm Karen Peter, and I'm here with Blake Smith, and we welcome you on this journey. So our question uh, each week is, where is Jesus this week? Or maybe even, where are we with Jesus this week? So this week, proper 14, or the 14th Sunday in Ordinary Time, which is the time that follows Pentecost, Jesus is back in the boat. He's been in and out of boats for a few weeks as we've been walking with Jesus and, I guess, rowing with Jesus. And Jesus has crossed for the other side of the lake where he goes up a mountain for some time alone. And again, when he does that, um, Matthew is purposely pointing our attention to the fact, just like Moses did. And so um, I think about that. So when I was a kid, I used to climb the hill by my house, and it. when you got to the crest of the hill, there was a giant boulder you could climb on top of, and when you sat there, there was an open view, which is unusual where I live because the trees are so tall. There was an open view of the entire valley floor if you climbed up there and sat on that rock. So that's what I picture when I picture Jesus going up the mountain. He's climbing up that hill. He's going to sit on that big boulder and look out over the valley. So the hill where Jesus is, um, or the mountain, must jut right up out of the water because it says that the disciples stay in the boat while Jesus goes up the hill. And so I'm thinking if there'd been a whole bunch of shoreline, they might have come in on the shore, but perhaps they're just, it wasn't how it was. And so they end up in the boat, unmoored, if you will, or unanchored as a storm comes up. So let's hear what happens, Blake. Right. So uh, just again for context, as we begin today, uh, we've just finished uh, with the feeding of the 5,000, uh, the disciples and Jesus. And we pick up in the 14th chapter of Matthew with the 22nd and uh, 22nd verse through the 33rd verse. Immediately, he made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. But by this time, the boat, battered by the waves, was far from the land, for the wind was against them. And early in the morning, he came walking toward them on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified, saying, It is a ghost. And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. He said, Come. So Peter got out of the boat, started walking on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he noticed the strong wind, he became frightened, and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and caught him, saying to him, You of little faith, why did you doubt? When they got into the boat, the wind ceased, and those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. Now, often when we hear this passage, we focus on what we might call the miracle side of it, the walking on the water. And none of us walk on water. So it might be easy for us in this passage to go, this just doesn't apply to me, except maybe the Peter part. Um, Okay, I I resent that. (laughs) Since (laughs) since my last name is Peter, but I really can't because I would, I probably would have done the same thing as Peter did. (laughs) I think one of the important things for me in this passage is, what's going on kind of before and after and and in the midst of this. So you've got Jesus who, even before the feeding of the 5,000, went up uh, to rest and to pray and and to be with God and then was 
fully prepared then for what was to come in the day ahead. And then again, he's done with that and he goes up to to rest and to pray. And uh, whereas the disciples were probably like, OK, great, it's done. Let's let's get in the boat and go before he changes his mind. <laughs> and, <laughs> and so when we get to the point of of Jesus interaction with Peter, you have Jesus who has spiritually prepared. He's taken time to rest for that self-care uh, that is needed, that respite that we all need. And Peter, on the other hand, has just kind of gone on with life. And then in that moment of crisis, cries out to God for, for saving. And, and I think, honestly, if I'm being honest, I know I do that. You know, you, you, you get busy in, in life, you get the day gets going before you know it, you're, you're in the midst of something and you're like, God, help me get out of this. Um, but I think there's important, an important, uh, signal here for us, if you will, that, that that self-care and respite and alone time is all part of healthy discipleship, especially when we spend time caring for others. And if you're a disciple of Jesus, uh, in some way, you're going to either be expected to care for others, if that's just in the way you treat them and respond to them and interact with them, or whether it is you feed them or give them clothing or or shelter. So, you know, here um, in this passage, the boat being tossed about is a metaphor for the challenges and difficulties in a life following Jesus. We've said time and time again, it's not easy. It's not going to be easy. There's a cost to discipleship. And early Christians were persecuted and didn't always know which way to turn. Um, Even even for non-disciples, storms come up in life. And uh, faith doesn't mean that we won't have choppy waters or leaky boats. Those, that's part of life. It's going to happen. Um, yep. Yeah, I, I always remember my dad said we had a boat for a while when I was when I was young. But the the kind of saying about boats is they're just a hole in the water that you throw money into. So <laughs> I mean, there's always something that needs to be fixed. Um, but what it what it does mean for us in this passage is that God is present with us in times of turmoil, and I think expects and honors our need for self care and for respite. So God's presence stills and calms uh, the storm. Prayer doesn't change God; prayer changes us. It's a way for us to be present in the calming presence of God. Yeah, I love that. That's an adaptation of a C.S. Lewis line. Um, prayer doesn't change God. Prayer changes me. That's that's the point of it. That's what Jesus is doing, shaping and forming himself and what we're called to do. So I, I think there's some great questions that come out of this. Um, one would be, how can I better prepare in advance for the crashing waves of life? Yeah. What kind of respite do I need? When have I felt... Or do I currently feel unmoored, tossed about by life and by the waves? How have I sensed the divine presence extend a hand to me in my time of need? And finally, what keeps me from grasping the hand of the divine that has been extended? Because we believe Mm -hmm. God's always there. We have to be willing to receive. So what's keeping me from grasping that hand? Yeah, that's an interesting Question, especially, I think, for people who have grown up in the U.S., because we are taught to be independent. Yeah. And that's important to us. And being Christian means you're interdependent. You're working in community. You're working with others. You're you're working with um, with God, with the divine presence. And that that doesn't work with our our idea of getting to the top on our own. Tough questions. Uh, this week. So one of the things that came to mind and I thought about it when I thought about how we could continue to experience this idea of being in this boat on choppy water and Jesus walking towards us was that on the um, on the website, all things are spiritual dot org. That's all all one word. (laughs) All things are spiritual dot org. We have some spiritual formation practices for kids. And one of them is actually called Stormy Seas. And it's this wonderful kind of guided, short guided meditation. And it's written for kids, but 
adults don't don't let that stop you it's um <laughs> it's a guided meditation about being on stormy seas and what that brings up inside of us the anxiety and the worry and the stress and how we can prepare ourselves um, through spiritual practice to meet that choppiness. So check it out on all things are spiritual.org under spirituality for kids, and then look for stormy seas. Um, the other thing that came to mind is uh, grasp an extended hand. Work on your handshake. My dad made me practice my handshake as a kid because at church, people were always shaking hands, like after a sermon or to greet you. After, you know, you go walking out and whoever preached that Sunday would shake everybody's hand on the way out back when we had manners, (laughs) which we don't do anymore. We just all get up and head to the local restaurant. But it used to be we shook everybody's hand on the way out. And I remember my dad teaching my brother and I um, how to shake hands properly and have a good handshake. So think about that this week um that that is something that really i mean it's amazing how mindful i am of that not not consciously but when i'm shaking somebody's hand i'm immediately taken back to those lessons because grip with a firm handshake you know don't don't grab with just your fingertips and all that those are the things i've taught and so when it happens sometimes somebody will you go to grasp somebody's hands and they grab it before you can get like yeah, all the way yeah. engaged and you're like, oh no, they're going to think I have a, <laughs> I'm not yeah, that's, that's well, as I, we, think I, have, um, I think I have nightmares about that as well. <laughs> well, as we do that, keeping in mind, you know, we still are talking about social distancing and some of those things in our lives as we're kind of working our way out of the pandemic. So, you know, be responsible <laughs> and all of those things. But um, if someone extends their hand to you, go ahead and, and, grasp that hand and do so as a way to um, really experience that person and to honor their presence as you shake their hand rather than just going through the motion. Uh, so that's what I've got. That's Blake, great. What's well, our... How about a blessing? Yeah. How about a blessing to send us off today? Our blessing comes from When I Can't Sleep by Ariane Breathwaite Lane. So maybe the disciples in the boat needed this. <laughs> this is, yes. this is, This is the blessing for the disciples in the boat. When I can't sleep, they could not sleep. So here we go. Quieting God, I ask for your gentle strength to cover my fears tonight. I'm afraid of the darkness, afraid of the uncontrollable, afraid of the unthinkable. I'm afraid of tomorrow. How will I make it through the day? How will I care for people who depend on me? How will I perform to meet expectations when I cannot think clearly or fall asleep on the job. I despair I will never sleep again, caught in the fear of coiling around my heart and anxiety compressing my mind. I ask, soothing one, that your presence would fill me with holy calm, that you would lift this pressure and deepen my breathing. I ask that your spirit of peace would whisper your truth in my ears, reminding me I need not be afraid. The fears feel so convincing and so real in my heart and in this world. Though the fears may not dissipate, your assurance strengthens me to face them, to name them for the small things they are in comparison to the great one within me, regardless of how I feel come tomorrow morning, you will not leave me to face the day alone. A marvelous blessing. Just a a great way to capture what is often missed in this passage, but is really at the heart of it. So, so thanks everybody for joining us again this week on Coffee to Go. Uh, we're glad to have you with us, and we hope that you'll join us again here at Coffee to Go for the next part of our journey through the liturgical seasons and holy days of the Christian tradition. Mm-hmm.